morning and welcome to the first meeting in 2013 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. I hope everyone had a, uh, an enjoyable and relaxing uh, recess. I'd like to remind everyone to please turn off any mobile phones, uh, tablets, electronic devices, Blackberries, etc. And can I welcome to the meeting and to the committee our new member, Malcolm Chisholm, who is replacing Elaine Murray, who is an extremely uh, productive and hard-working member of the committee, and I'd like to pay tribute to all her efforts uh, while a member of our committee, and I hope she uh, enjoys her new uh, posting. Um, uh, our first item of business in this morning this morning is to deal with a declaration of interest from Malcolm, and therefore I'd like to ask if he has anything to declare. Well, I'll just repeat what's on my written uh, declaration, which is that I'm a member of both the Educational Institute of Scotland and UNISON. Thank you uh, very much. Our second item of business this morning is to decide whether to take item five in private. Are members agreed? Members are indeed agreed. <coughs> Moving on to the third item on our agenda, uh, it is to take evidence from John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth on, dem uh, on the issue of demographic change and ageing population. The Cabinet Secretary is accompanied by Katrina Carmichael, Andrew Watson and Peter Whitehouse from the Scottish Government. So I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary, the first of what, of what will no doubt be many visits to the committee over, the, over this year, and I invite you to make a short opening statement. Mr. Uh, thank you, Kavir. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to participate in the committee's uh, wide-ranging inquiry on these questions. The issues that the committee has been considering are of real importance to public policy making and to the public finances. There are real challenges to be faced. Uh, the government recognises that and I welcome the input of the committee in the process of those deliberations. At a time when there are significant constraints on the public finances, it is vital that we consider the impacts of our ageing population. In doing so, the discussion must be about more than cost, uh, important as that is, because the decisions we need to take in response to demographic changes also need to reflect the changing nature of the demands on our public services, how we design those services so that they best meet the needs of our people, and how the values of our society are best reflected in our approach. We need a rounded debate about these questions. I have followed with interest the committee's previous evidence sessions and welcome the broad degree of consensus that has emerged on some of the issues. In particular, there is consensus about the need for a more preventative approach which has the potential to improve the lives of individuals and communities whilst reducing costs. As the committee will know, the government is committed to such an approach and it is central both to our budget proposals and to our response to the work of the Christie Commission. I share the concerns of others that we need to ensure effective monitoring of performance across the public sector to support this agenda. The Government is committed to working with others to make this happen. One step we have already taken is to make it a requirement that the next round of single outcome agreements include a prevention plan from all community planning partnerships. There is also, I think, consensus support for continuing reform for public services, particularly around steps that will help different organisations work more effectively across institutional boundaries. Our pro programme to reshape care for older people is, of course, of central importance in this respect, but the issues apply across the public sector. These issues are going to be critical to our thinking as we prepare for the further financial constraints that have been sig signalled um, by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and I very much welcome the contribution that the Committee's work can make to that process. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Swinney. And as uh, usual, I will uh, start by asking some questions and open, open the session out to uh, colleagues around the table. So, First uh, question I'd like to ask you, um, we've obviously received a lot of evidence from organisations such as NH boards and local authorities, and as come up uh, yesterday in the employability debate, they have indicated that short-term budget provision makes it difficult for them to plan as strategically as they would like. So I'm just wondering whether or not the current system of allocating resources will be reconsidered in any way. Uh, that would help in planning um, the long-term provision of services for our ageing population? I think there's a, a, a couple of relevant points in there, Kavina. The first I would make is, particularly if, if I focus my remarks specifically on health boards and local authorities, and um, in that way distinguish from the point that Mr Brown was pursuing, particularly in the committee, in the committee debate yesterday on the third sector. From the perspective of local authorities and health boards, um, the financial allocations that they are receiving, I think, are pretty clear over a three-year period. 
um, the current three-year period of the spending review. Um, I set out in the autumn of 2011, um, based on the information that had been made available to me, um, in indicative financial allocations for all budget areas, but the principal blocks of um, health board expenditure and um, local authority expenditure um, were pretty clearly expressed for a three-year period. Now, I accept that there is an individual annual budget process that has to be gone through, and there could well be changes at the margin. But there are changes at the margin. Uh, I think any assessment of the 13-14 budget versus what I set out in the spending review in 2011 demonstrates that you know, the changes to the budget are pretty peripheral, um, given the decisions that we took in the spending review. So I really don't think there is anything that inhibits uh, a health board or a local authority taking a fairly firm three-year assessment of where they think their budget is going and planning accordingly. Beyond a three-year period, that is slightly more difficult. That's my second point, convener, given that the United Kingdom government sets out um, a three-year perspective. Um, if I'm if my memory serves me right, when the Chancellor made the spending review in the autumn of 2010, he must have set out a four-year perspective. Uh, he did, yes, um, for financial years 2011-12 to 14-15. Um, we um, clearly gave a three-year spending review in the autumn of 2011 once the government had been returned. And I think it gives a, a fair amount of clarity to particularly health boards and local authorities, as you raised in your question. It's quite a separate issue about what clarity is then given to other organisations, which is the point that Mr Brown was making in the debate yesterday, which I will consider further as to whether or not there is more the government can do to assist in that respect. Yes, because the Royal Society of Edinburgh, they also um, made a point on this issue. They said that the annuality of the current budget process should be reviewed as it restricts long-term prioritisation of spend and reduction of costs at a time of taking a public expenditure. So that's clearly uh, an issue for a number of organisations. But they also highlight the need for employees to build up savings and invest in pension schemes uh, you know, because of the ageing population. How, how realistic is that in the current economic climate and for the foreseeable future? Just before I come on to the savings point, Kavir, could I just add one other point to the original answer, which you, you, your point about the Royal Society uh, just prompted me to think, to, 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 to consider. And that is that the government has set out, um, you know, we set out a three-year spending review perspective, but we also set out some long-term directions of policy. Um, now, you could say, well, those change with the changes of political leadership. But if I go back to some of the policies that were established by um, our predecessors, um, particularly in relation to the, set, the, the field of um, public health policy, for example, or in terms of social care, many of the policy directions that we are taking are a continuation of a direction of travel that was actually established long before this government came to office. So we, we quite willingly acknowledge that um, we are continuing directions of, of, of travel that have been agreed broadly across the parliamentary um, uh, debate. Now, my reason for making that point is that I think, frankly, it's a bit of an excuse for people to say we don't have long-term policy clarity, because anybody looking at the debate contributions of for example, the SNP members to the debate on um, banning smoking in public places in the middle of which you, Kavira, were a pro prominent exponent in the first parliament. Then looking at what the Labour and Liberal administration did from 2003 to 2007, would see, regardless of who happened to be in the government, it was pretty clear there was going to be a sustained um, amount of pressure applied right across the political spectrum, SNP members, Labour members, Liberal members, about a major issue of public health policy like smoking, banning smoking in public places. So I think that there is any assessment of the policy debate that's going on within Parliament should give reasonable confidence to people 
about long-term direction of travel in terms of policy. And indeed, the debate on employability yesterday, I thought rather helped to illustrate that point, assisted by the dispassionate report of the committee, but it gave a pretty clear signal to anybody listening to that debate where Parliament was as a whole, not just where the government was. So therefore, a certain amount of longer term policy clarity could be established. So regardless of whether or not there is um, uh, you know, more than a three year budget settlement able to be offered, I think there can be lessons deduced by public bodies about what is the direction of public policy and as a consequence longer term preparations can be undertaken. So, the, to, to move then on to the, the point that you make, Convener, about um, the ability of individuals to build up saving spots, of course, the, 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 there is an importance that we structure the debate around encouraging individuals to plan for the long term. Um, if there is any lesson to be deduced, any a number of lessons to be deduced from the financial crash, it is that... Uh, having an eye on long-term financial issues is a good thing for institutions and for individuals. So therefore we would encourage and, and do encourage individuals to, to plan and to save for the long term. Clearly at a time of increasing financial pressure on households, given the fact that there has been pay constraint in both the private and the public sectors uh, for a, a reasonable period of time, given the fact that there is um, a, a, a rising cost of living and some particularly acute increased costs on individuals, uh, the ability of individuals to actually save effectively for the long term is uh, constrained by the resources they will have available to them at any given time. Okay, now pulling in alignment of uh, local authority and health budgets uh, seems a sensible way forward and that appears to be happening in a number of places, the Highlands and Ireland seems to be one area in particular which has been drawn to our attention. I'm just wondering um, what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that such work it takes place across the country and that we break down this kind of silo mentality which the committee has heard much about over the last year or so. In answering that question, I think, Kavir, we have to go back to the thinking that the Government put in place in 2007 where we in the spending review in 2007, set out um, to make a number of reforms in local government, particularly the removal of ring fencing, which essentially enabled local authorities to exercise greater financial discretion about how they allocated their resources. With that came a renewed emphasis on the role of community planning partnerships, particularly in formulating um, outcome agreements that would be produced not just by local authorities, but by all public bodies taking part in the community planning partnerships. So we made it um, mandatory by the 1st of April 2009 that all community planning partnerships must formulate an outcome agreement representing all community planning partnership interests, which was fulfilled by all of these partnerships. Um, that has therefore created, I think, a better climate in which organisations can jointly plan their financial um, resources. Clearly, in terms of public sector accountability, an NHS uh, board chief executive remains accountable, as it remains the accountable officer for the resources for which they are spending, in the same way as a chief executive of a local authority remains an accountable officer. But that does not in any way inhibit the ability of those organisations through the, plan the community planning infrastructure to um, utilise their resources in a complementary fashion. And um, that whole approach has been reinforced by the government's response to the Christie Commission, which again has um, placed greater requirements on um, community planning partnerships to formulate agreed plans representing a range of different public bodies focused on the achievement of the same outcomes therefore using that as a device to tackle what I would acknowledge, Convener, as a, a fair assessment of some of the practice within the public sector, that it can be affected by uh, what, what would be described as a silo mentality. So the whole approach to community planning, 
to encouraging different public bodies to work together at local level is designed to achieve the objective that you've set out in your question. Now, some of that will be given some further um, legislative force by the Adult Health and Social Care Integration Bill that my colleagues in the Health Portfolio are bringing forward and is the subject of active discussion with, with stakeholders at the present time. Um, and that will assist in trying to entrench that uh, direction of travel that the Government has established. You know, throughout this inquiry, indeed, uh, before it, um, a number of organisations have um, raised concerns about the lack of resources uh, so, uh, um, uh, available to fund uh, housing adaptations, which uh, many uh, witnesses to the committee said would be particularly cost-effective in allowing older people to live independently. So I'm just wondering if there's any plans to look again at this budget. Now, we need Scotland specifically raised that. I asked them, well, um, how would you actually fund that? Because one of the things that the committee has been concerned about, both in the, the evidence uh, that we received in terms of the budget and indeed this demographic inquiry, is that everyone who comes to us says, if only you spend more money in our particular sector, you know, you'll be able to save, uh, you know, the Scottish budget X amount. And everyone says that, and everyone obviously thinks more. And we, and we always ask the question, myself and John in particular, um, what, what area f um, should be cut, for example, in order that that could be funded? And to be honest, uh, we don't often get many replies, but when I did put this issue to Age Scotland, they said, well, um, you could actually increase the age at which people qualify for concessionary travel to 65. So I'm just wondering in your response, if that's, uh, along with housing adaptations, if you would also respond to that point, if that's something the Scottish Government would uh, would be willing to consider. The, the, the government has, has made clear that we have no plans to change the eligibility criteria for concessionary travel. So you know, that, that's, a, that's a, it's a restatement of the, of the government's position. I think on the point on, on housing adaptations, I, I acknowledge the, 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 the point in principle and the significance of the point in principle that, uh, that, that, that you're making, convener, that um, there are um, with relatively modest, or in some cases some more substantial adaptations, better ways of ensuring that older people can remain in their own homes. And I think that, again, going back to the points of consensus, it's absolutely crystal clear that there's a consensus that of, of view that older people will, um, with the necessary assessment of their own circumstances, be best placed to be in their own home for as long as we possibly can sustain that and encourage that. Um, now, to enable that to happen, there may be the need for certain adaptations to be undertaken. There may also be the need for, um, and I'm always struck by some of the lessons I learned from the Fire and Rescue Service, that uh, some of the Fire and Rescue Service uh, personnel in my own constituency spend a large part of their time either fitting smoke alarms to the the houses of elderly people are removing uh, extension cables that are propping up some piece of electrical equipment which in all of our interests should be removed and they consider this to be and, and they're absolutely right in this respect a very good use of their time if they can get rid of you know hazardous extension cables that somebody could readily trip over and you know i think it's a a, a good example of how all of our public services can contribute towards preventative interventions in the way the Fire and Rescue Service are doing. So I think there's a, there is a good case on, on, on adaptation. The, the government had set the, the budget for adaptations at um, £6 million for 2012-13. Um, we put that up to, two th to £8 million for 2012-13, which gave continuity between 11-12 and 12-13. Um, the uh, Margaret Burgess, my colleague, the Minister for Housing and Welfare, um, has uh, an outstanding commitment to consider the, well, to meet with the independent chair of the uh, Adaptations Working Group that has looked at all of these issues. It reported in, um, it reported in November, and the uh, report was published on the government's website in December, and there has been. Essentially, I, I suppose to summarise the, the recommendations of the working group, they were essentially arguing that um, we should be focusing uh, much more on a person-centred approach rather than a tenure-based approach, which um, 
uh, is, the, is the, the, the nature of the current programme. Um, so Margaret Burgess will, will meet with the, the, the group and the government will formulate its response accordingly. Uh, but clearly this is another example where um, preventative measures may have uh, a greater impact on supporting uh, older people and we'll consider very carefully the, the recommendations of the, the adaptation group. I'm just going to ask you one final question before I open it out to colleagues, and that's an issue which again has been raised on a number of occasions, uh, uh, um, including in this uh, particular um, uh, area of, of um, demography, and most recently again by Age Scotland, and it was about the, the fact that of the older people's health and care budget of about 4.6 billion, a whopping 1.5 billion of it is spent annually on delayed discharge and unexpected admissions. And I'm just wondering. Um, how this is being addressed by the Scottish Government? There is um, a sustained amount of activity undertaken um, by um, joint working by health boards and local authorities to avoid delayed discharges. Um, and the, I, I don't think I have in front of me um, specific information on the current performance on delayed discharges, convener. Um, but I'm certainly happy to furnish the committee with an up-to-date position on that. Um, but it's a, a major priority of, of, uh, of the ministerial team to work with local government and the health boards to, to minimise delayed discharge. Uh, I think the fact that uh, I think the very fair point that's made is that um, you know certainly for the last figures that I've seen, you know, we are spending more money on unplanned admissions than we are on social care. Um, in 2008-9, um, 1.4 billion on unplanned admissions for older people, and 1.2 billion on social care for the same grouping of individuals. Um, clearly, that uh, if we can minimise unplanned admissions, if we can maximise the amount of support that can be delivered for individuals in their own home, in a care setting which delivers the best results, then clearly um, the outcomes for individuals will be better. Uh, and crucially, the, um, the utilisation of public sector resources will be improved. Now, that really is at the heart of the health and social care integration debate. That's, that really is the motivation behind the government's reform agenda in that respect. So I think um, in, in terms of the, 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 the short-term issue of ensuring that um, older people are cared for in the most appropriate setting, which means that if they can be in their own home or in a, a, a more appropriate setting than in front, uh, an, an acute hospital bed, then we will be working to achieve that, which is the purpose of the delayed discharge focus. But there is also the, um, the need to pursue the, um, the integration of health and social care, which lies at the, the heart of providing a strategic answer to the question that you raised, Kavina. Thank you. I'm um, now going to open out to the committee, and uh, the first person to ask questions will be the Deputy Convener, to be followed by Jamie. Uh, thanks, Convener, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, I mean, just to kind of start with a kind of broader picture, I just would be interested in your view and the government's view, because sometimes when we find out that people are living longer, uh, we read about it in the media like this is bad news, and. Um, that uh, it's all doom and gloom and if people live five years longer that means they're five years in hospital or five years in a care home or five years wh uh, whatever and we've all got to kind of subsidise it. But we have at the committee had heard some evidence that actually um, having more older people does mean there's more carers out there, people can work a bit longer. Uh, there seems to be a bit of doubt over healthy life expectancy and how long unhealthy life expectancy is going to be in the future. I think the jury still seems to be out in that. So from a general point of view, I mean, is the government happy that people are living longer? <laughs> uh, I, I, and does it, do, do you have a, a very, do, do you share the pessimistic view of the future, that it's all doom and gloom? Well, I, 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 think, I think Mr Mason knows me long enough to know that I'm not in any way a pessimist. And, uh, and, and, and I, I, I can confirm on behalf of the government that we are delighted that people are living longer, uh, in case there's any doubt about that point. 
Um, I, I did, over the, the, the festive break, I, I, I was greatly encouraged by a newspaper article that I read, which of course doesn't happen often, that I'm greatly encouraged by newspaper articles, which said that 60 was the new 40. So it, it convinces me that I have a lot to look forward to <laughs> in the as, uh, as in, the, in the many years that I have to wait until I, I reach my 60th birthday. Um, but I, I think that there is a, I, I think Mr Mason fairly characterises the debate that somehow an extension to longevity is inevitably a problem for our society. I, you know, I, I, I can think anecdotally of individuals um, who, you know, are thriving utterly thriving in their 90s and in need of next to no intervention from the state whatsoever. Um, they just have led health, good, strong, healthy lives and are uh, continuing to fulfil a great commitment to their communities. And I, I, can, I can think of a number of people who fall into that category uh, as I sit here. So I think there's a I think we've got to take a pretty broad perspective about all of this. Clearly, um, longevity um, it does mean that individuals in certain circumstances will require more support. In other circumstances, it also means they can continue to make a vibrant contribution to our society. And I think when I look at the, the volunteering efforts that go on, when I look at the leadership that is exercised by people who are, if I can say it, in their retirement, in social enterprises and other organisations and members, my colleagues across the country will see all, all of this in their own communities, um, that, that many of these organisations and many social care situations could not survive without that type of commitment. So I, I think I, I would take a fundamentally optimistic view out of all of that. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, we did have some quite stark figures, especially from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, about the divergence in life expectancy uh, between some areas where people are both uh, living longer and their healthy life expectancy is getting longer, uh, whereas in other areas, and I have to say the East End of Glasgow would be one of them, where neither uh, healthy life expectancy nor total life expectancy uh, are very great. Um, ha has the government any thinking about how we might kind of compress these two and bring them together? Well, that, that, that I, think, I think, gets to the heart of the debate that we, that, that, that we take forward on a whole host of different questions. Um, I mentioned in my answers to the convener a moment ago the approaches that um, the previous government and, and our government are taking in relation to, um, to uh, smoking. Um, our government has taken forward um, the uh, approach on minimum pricing of alcohol, recognising that the relationships between alcohol and tobacco um, use um, have very significant consequences for the life expectancy of individuals um, in the categories to which Mr Mason refers. So there will be um, a range of public health interventions that will be taken. And some of these will be around some of the very simple steps that individuals can take to better manage their own health. Um, I, I recall when the government was considering back in 2007 the strategic focus we would give to the health service, we considered what should be the focus of that message and ultimately settled on the, on the best expression of our approach on health, that we should be enabling people to lead healthier lives. So that's, it's not about saying the state's got to do everything for individuals, it is about giving people the equipment the arguments and the knowledge as to how they can lead healthier lives, some of which comes back to the, um, <clears throat> the relatively simple public health messages that are put out about uh, routine, pretty elementary exercise that individuals can, can, can undertake to improve their, the, their own health. There are obviously education interventions that are taken to ensure that um, as we now look at the population groups in some of these areas of, uh, of uh, deprivation within our society, that we are making the earliest of interventions to try to support individuals um, as they are born into communities to structure better life chances for those individuals. And that lies at the heart of the preventative spending agenda that the government takes forward. 
And a lot of that can be taken, uh, can be applied at different stages in people's lives. Um, older people in the community that Mr Mason represents, um, in terms of the way in which the government's approaches are structured, should be better able to receive support which um, is anticipating some of the challenges they may well face to then support those individuals in the longer term. So I think the, 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 the the policy response the government has in place of shifting the focus to preventative measures, to pursuing proactive public health and public education messages are designed to tackle some of the issues that Mr Mason raised. Okay, th thank you. Uh, I mean, I'd like to move on to as well housing, which the convener's already mentioned, but we, we took quite a lot of evidence here, and I think that's quite a key issue as far as I'm concerned. I mean, looking longer term, I mean, beyond the three years, five, 10, 20 years, whatever, you know, do we need to change the mix or the emphasis? I mean, sh should we emphasise the adaptations, as has been mentioned already, or is that just a short-term approach? Should we be looking at a lot more new housing, which is suitable for people to carry on living in as they get older, as they have a wheelchair, all that kind of thing? Uh, or is that just uh, going to be too expensive to do that? And then I suppose linked with that then, I mean, if we are serious about the preventative spending, and if we are spending too much on hospital admissions, then at some point in the future, you know, can we cut the health budget and put more into housing? Or should we be able to do that? The, 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 the way of approaching this, I think, is to make sure that our planning of um, the housing sector, whether that is about new development or um, refurbishment or adaptation of existing properties, is undertaken in alignment with our expectations about demand in localities in our communities. So ensuring that, for example, as we plan to meet housing demand in different areas, we are taking due account of the likely picture of demographic change that will be undertaken is essential um, to ensure that we have a housing stock that is appropriate for the needs of individuals at given times in their lives. Now, we will all wrestle with the fact that um, we have, uh, you know, there will be families, I have families I deal with in my own constituency who are living in overcrowded accommodation and could do with living in larger public sector housing that um, is certainly in existence in the communities that I represent, but it's currently occupied by people who've been in those properties for 30 or 40 years. Now, the way to solve all that is to make sure that we've got appropriate accommodation that we can offer to individuals who can then see that there's a better prospect, a better set of circumstances for them to live in, you know, all on the one level rather than up and down stairs and all the inherent dangers that come with that um, at a later stage in their life. But that, if that requires effective planning of the housing sector at local level and what my answer to the convener uh, at the very outset about the focus on community planning is designed to do exactly that. It's to get together all of the key players at local level to ensure that public sector resources that are available to be spent in any given locality are able to be taken forward in a fashion that meets that wide range of expectations within public policy. So making sure there's a strong, um, you know, certainly can think of in, in the area that I represent in Perth and Kinross, very, very strong and integrated dialogue between the local authority as a housing provider and the housing associations within the local area, um, working very much together to determine how they can meet the needs of the population and how they can manage some of these points of transition that are required for individuals that might require a, a different housing approach. I mean, if I could just press you on that point, I mean, do, do you think at a local level that there is the willingness or the ability to, say, invest in very sheltered housing, which we're being told about, um, or does there need to be some direction from the centre? I think, well, the, the, what we have um, a required in terms of the... Um, the, 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 the guidance that's been given to the uh, recently formed health and social care uh, partnerships is uh, the inclusion of a housing contribution statement into that process. So at the heart of this integration debate, we are acknowledging the um, 
the importance of housing as a contributory factor in that respect. And that housing contribution statement um, will clearly articulate the links between housing plans and the approaches to health and social care uh, commissioning. And it's essentially designed to fill a gap in ensuring that the housing contribution um, is utilised to address the particular requirements in health and social care. So I think we've given the guidance at national level that that has to be undertaken at local level. Um, I think the planning and the articulation of that is best done at local level because that's where, the, that's where the, the, the patterns and the factors will be best determined. But the strategic direction of ensuring that housing is recognised as a key part in the integration debate um, lies at the heart of the approach that the government has taken. Okay, and just finally, I mean, if there was to be a switch at some stage in the future from health, say, to housing, could that also be done at a local level? Or would that have to be done centrally? Resources are, are allocated um, by the government through particular channels um, and budget headings with which the committee is, is, is closely familiar. Um, obviously, changes can take place in, in budget allocations as they, as they do. Um, there is also, and, and I, I, I think it's really important that I make this point, that doesn't need to be the only way in which um, contributions are made to housing provision. Um, you can, for ex by the joint approach to planning and development of budgets at local level, there is absolutely nothing to stop uh, different public bodies making a contribution to the creation of integrated pots of funding to deliver particular outcomes at local level. And I can think of projects uh, in my own constituency that only happen because the health board and the local authority puts in money to make sure they can happen. And they're joint projects. <coughs> they enable us to get past the silo mentality and the obstacles that can be created by institutional budgets that the convener was talking about in his earlier questions to me. And uh, that is another way in which this debate can happen. And that can happen today. That you know, public bodies are perfectly empowered to take forward some of that work if they are jointly planning and commissioning services. Jamie, to be followed by Malcolm. Thank you, uh, uh, Convener. The Deputy Convener mentioned uh, briefly uh, in his first question to come uh, to the uh, issue of, uh, as we get a uh, increased number of older uh, people uh, in uh, our population, there will also be an increased number of carers. Uh, and uh, indeed, Carers Scotland uh, told us they estimate there will be one million carers by uh, 2037. They also made the point as the population lives longer, uh, there will be an increased number of older carers uh, in particular. So I'm just wondering how the, the Scottish Government uh, is uh, planning on trying to factor that in and how uh, these types of people will be uh, supported as any strategy to do with uh, the changed demographic situation. The, 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 the government's carer strategy is, um, is essentially has been constructed after um, a significant dialogue with the carer sector uh, within Scotland. We acknowledge that carers contribute enormously to providing support for individuals within our society and without their contribution, uh, the, state, well, the state would be unable to fulfil or to replace the commitment and the, the, the contribution made by carers. So the formulation of a carer strategy that is, um, uh, that has had the input and the contribution of um, Carers organisations is very important in structuring the different priorities that we can take forward. There will be a whole range of, of elements in that. Um, some of them will uh, res relate to the, the training and the support and the advice that can be given to carers, uh, whether that's about um, some of the, um, the physical requirements that they may be involved in or perhaps some of the financial issues that they need to be um, uh, aware of. There will also be other aspects of specific support, whether it's about um, um, respite support to, to carers or whether it's about ensuring that um, carers have access to all of the um, supporting uh, infrastructure that can assist them in fulfilling their commitments. So ma making sure that as we approach these challenges, we maintain a strong and open dialogue with the carer sector 
um, is a very important part of the government's response. Okay, that, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, Malcolm, to be followed by Gavin. I've got a kind of sense of uh, deja vu because the, the last thing I was doing before I left the government was, was working on the strategy for Scotland with an ageing population. And a, a lot of the themes were very, very similar. And I suppose we were really keen to emphasise not just all the service and care issues, but also the contribution of older people, which I know you've covered to some extent in terms of volunteering, caring, spending power in many cases to local economies, but also employment. And I suppose I wonder, partly connected with yesterday's debate, what the government's would view would be given the different economic and employment situation about older people and uh, work, because clearly that potentially could be another area where older people can contribute, given that 60 is the new 40, and, uh, as I can confirm, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and 70, hopefully, is the new 50. So I would welcome your comments on that. But I suppose more generally, just I'm curious to know to what extent the many recommendations of that report, which came out just before the 2007 election, to what extent they were progressed or whether in a kind of way you started um, to work on these issues, as it were, from scratch? In, in terms of the, 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 the policy agenda in relation to Mr Chisholm's final point, um, I, I think there's a, uh, you know, a, a great misnomer about large parts of politics that, and I suppose, you know, politics is characterised almost inevitably, I suppose, um, by what happens, certainly in this institution, between 12 and 12.30 on a Thursday, um, which, um, you know, depending on one's perspective, can be a good or a bad thing. Um, whereas I think actually there's you know, a tremendous amount of very good and consistent work that uh, transcends changes of political administration. And, and I, I've, I've made no secret of the, the fact that I consider many of the approaches um, that this administration takes are building on um, sensible plans and policy directions established by our predecessors, which many of which, I think in a whole range of different areas, we supported in opposition. Um, and if I, so I, th I think in terms of the the, the general direction of, of, of policy, um, I, I don't think that we've in any way um, a changed tack from the approach that was taken by our predecessors. I think what we have done is intensified the pace by which these issues have to be confronted because of the issues that Mr Mason was raising about um, the, the, the pattern of longevity and, and how we need to respond to that. So that then flows into some of the uh, areas that we're taking forward on public service reform on um, the preventative agenda and intensifying the work that's undertaken in that respect. On the question of employment of older people, clearly there is um, a very uh, strong opportunity for older people to remain in employment. And we will find um, across different parts of the economy, and some of these points were made in the debate yesterday, um, despite the levels of unemployment that we have today, too high levels of unemployment, there are still skills shortages in different parts of the country, which I'm quite sure could be fulfilled by older people in certain given circumstances. So I think we have to be um, aware of the contribution that older people can make in employment terms. I think we have to be careful that there isn't, um, you know, whilst we all might be um, a very supportive of 60 being the new 40. Um, in employment practices, that might not always be perceived to be the case, and there may be questions of um, uh, you know, age being an impediment in the eyes of employers to individuals making a contribution. I think that should just be left to, to what individuals can contribute in an assessment of their capability. Uh, but certainly in principle, something the government would, uh, would welcome. If I can just mention one other document from the past, which I know the general thrust of which you accepted was the David Kerr report on health. And in a kind of way, the fundamental point about that, perhaps not what was most publicised, but the fundamental point was unless we start uh, caring for older people in a different way, the health service budget is unsustainable. And, and the main thing they flagged up was an un, unscheduled, unplanned emergency admission. So in a kind of way, you could say it's almost been this one of the central objectives of health policy over the last seven or eight years to do something about that. And, I mean, I raised this with Alec Neil yesterday, but it is rather worrying that 
you know, they're, you know, in spite of that being such an important part of health policy, it doesn't seem to have shifted, and we're actually having increasing numbers of unplanned uh, admissions. So I just, I mean, I just wonder, in fact, whether there's been any analysis of why that has been such a difficult uh, issue to shift, because clearly, and the evidence, uh, as John said, is, or, or perhaps Kenny, uh, was, you know, that a lot of money could be saved if, if, if you know, if more people could be cared of appropriately in the in the community, so I, I just wondered whether, you know, whether people were reconsidering that, and whether it was just going to be a lot more difficult than people had hoped, not least because of, there's just an increasing number of people living to be uh, over 85, or whether in fact you're confident that the integration agenda which you flagged up will in itself make the step change. That essentially is my answer. Mm. That the integration agenda uh, has um, has real momentum. Uh, about it, um, that is, it's a, a continuation of the direction of, of travel we set out in 2007, um, and the legislation will give greater force to this point. I think if I can illustrate the, 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 the significance of the issue that Mr. Chisholm raises, um, if we look at, uh, and I know this is not an absolutely identical comparison, but it makes my it makes my point for me. Um, the average care pa home care package um, costs about £6,000 per annum. The cost of a geriatric long-stay hospital bed is £47,000 per annum. Now, I, I appreciate if somebody needs to be in an acute hospital, they need to be in an acute hospital, but if they don't, they could be in their own home receiving care and support at a, delivering a better outcome for them and at a much lower cost to the public purse. So the, 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 the integration of health and social care is um, absolutely crucial to achieving the, that objective, and that is why uh, so much emphasis and impetus has been put behind that, uh, that proposition. If I can just have one final um, question, convener. I mean, I, in relation to the recent uh, census, I mean, I, th I think, um, from my point of view, the really good news in that was the perhaps unexpected increase in, um, in, the, in the very young population, because obviously that will change some of these ratios in due course between working population and older people. But I just wonder, I mean, the headlines were still taken in most cases by the number of older people, though I didn't have the impression there was anything very new there. But I wonder whether the government's analysed the census. I mean, I think one of the problems in 2001 with the free personal care projections was that we didn't have up to date census information and uh, there was certainly no uh, defect in the, in the person doing the work because it was our own advisor, Professor David Bell. Uh, but I just wonder whether in fact any analysis of, um, of the census has been done and whether it's changed any of the assessments or projections uh, for the elderly <coughs> population uh, in, the, in the next few years. I think that the first thing to say is that Mr Chisholm is absolutely correct that the census, um, the emphasis of the media coverage around the census, the headline, and this is just the headline information on the census that has come out so far, um, really in terms of the older population did not say anything that was particularly different from um, the information that had previously been uh, projected. Um, if I... A, just well, for example, the, for people aged 65 and over, the census was 0.3% below the 2011 mid-year estimates. Um, the census estimates for over 80s was 2% below the mid-year estimates. So, um, you know, there was some difference, but not that would the, 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 the characterisation that somehow this was a great revelation that we had a lot more older people. Um, was not a great revelation because we knew that all along, but actually the content of the census undermined that, that, that view. Um, so clearly the, the, we, ha we have just got the, the headline information on the census. There will be a great deal more information is now emerging from the census during 2013. And of course that will be uh, of enormous significance in, in, in planning the future provision of public services. Okay. Uh, Gavin, to be followed by Michael. Thanks, Convener. Can I um, just return to the, something the Convener asked about, which was the Age Scotland figure of 1.5 billion that's spent on delayed discharge and unexpected admissions on hospital. Do you have a sense, I mean, that, that gives you a figure, presumably, for one uh, financial year. 
Do you have a sense of what the trend is for that figure? Is it going up? Is it going down? Has it been static? Um, do you have a sense of that? Um, the, the, I, I don't have detailed figures in front of me uh, today. Um, there has been, um, on, on unplanned admissions, um, the figure I have for 2008-9 um, was 1.4 billion on unplanned admissions. Um, I, I, if the 1.5 billion figure that Age Scotland are using on delayed discharge and unplanned admissions, I, you know, I'm assuming that's a combined figure, so I, I would want to take care before I made any judgment about the, the number that they've used there. I'm not familiar with the number that they've used in that, uh, in that case. You don't have figures in front of you, which is fair enough, but is that something the government could provide to this committee to, to give us, you know, because telling us that it was 1.4 in 8-9 in is, is, I suppose, a useful starting point. Is that something that can easily be given to this committee to give Certainly us a trend? try to provide the committee with, uh, if there's specific points of information the committee would, uh, would find helpful, we'll do all that we can to try to provide that. Okay, thank you. Um, the second point I wanted to raise was the City of Edinburgh Council gave evidence to us a couple of months ago and they say that they try to project key debit they've got a project at the moment where they're projecting key demographic trends to 2035 um, and looking at how that those demographic trends will impact on service areas for which the council are responsible for so they're taking up you know, just over 20 year plan i suppose one other council and i have to confess i forget which um, was taking a five-year um, plan. So quite a big difference between 20, 20 years plus and a five-year plan. Where does the Scottish Government sit in relation to that in terms of the long-term planning that you're doing as a government? Are you more at the 20-year end or are you more at the five-year end? Where, where are you in relation to that? Um, the Government um, clearly uses a a, a range of different uh, indicators that are available, principally extrapolated from the census in terms of providing um, population and household projections. Um, those will vary in different policy areas um, to provide uh, clarity about um, the range of uh, issues that we have to consider uh, as a government. Um, Clearly, the approach that we take um, must uh, take into account the evidence base that's available from the population projections. And as I cited a moment ago, you know, those population projections can, you know, they tend to be in the in the right kind of ballpark. Although you know, most people were very surprised by the increase in the population that took place, and of course. Given that I think I've read over my time a very significant um, a media commentary about how the Scottish population was going to be declining to its lowest ever level, and you know it's now at its highest ever level, um, I think you know there's a certain amount of uh, caution we've got to take with all of these projections. Okay, no, I mean, like I said, I mean, there was there was fears, I think, of it going below five million at one point, uh, so t ten, fifteen. Well, about five million. Um, but in, but it, okay, so it, it does depend upon the policy area. But are you know, as, as a general rule, does does the government do ten year planning, twenty year planning? Does it have a, a general rule it aims for? I, I wouldn't say there's a general rule that we aim for. It will it will relate to different policy questions and policy issues that we have to resolve. Michael to be followed by Jean. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, and thanks, uh, Cabinet Secretary, for the, your contribution so far because there's a lot of it that I think every one of us around this table would sign up to in terms of you know, the, the consensus that exists and has existed uh, for a long period of time in relation to direction of travel and the, the realisation of the, the demographic change and what has to, uh, to take place in relation to that. And as uh, John Mason said about the 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 realisation that there is a demographic change uh, is not bad news. Um, I would agree with you that it's not news at all, uh, because we have had, as Malcolm said, things like the CARE report, which was looking at this because we knew that this was happening. Beveridge looked into this, Christie looked into this. So there is a lot of consensus and all the, the, the politicians around the, the parliament around this table all accept that that is the reality. So there, there really has to be a consensus. 
But the, in the discussions that we've had up to this point, I've sensed a lot of frustration from practitioners, academics and others that, well, that, that consensus exists, there are barriers to the progress being made that everyone sort of signs up to and says has to be made. And I think the Association of Directors of Social Work summed it up when they said it will require political leadership and public confidence that planned bed closures are not service cuts. Um, and I was just wondering, if, sort of more philosophically uh, rather than practically, how do we get uh, over that, those types of barriers that you know, across political parties, between layers of government, everyone signs up and there is a consensus about what needs to be done, but it breaks down because it's difficult to make tough decisions at local levels or central level or whatever, um, which you know, don't chime with the, the, uh, the desires of the, the academics and the practitioners. Can I, can I just ask Mr McMahon to give me the quote again from the Associate Director of Social Work, because I didn't quite hear. Yeah, it says, uh, it was talking in relation to the, the emergency admission, so it's, it's, it's a specific example, but I suppose you can uh, use it across a whole uh, array of, of issues. They're talking about emergency inpatient admissions. And they were talking about the demographic change, getting the balance right, and they said, but to, ha to have this happen will require political leadership and public confidence that planned bed closures are not service cuts. Uh, so, sorry, I just I, I couldn't quite hear. Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 I'm familiar with the territory. <laughs> let, me, let me put it like that. I think, the, I think this is, in, in a sense, that, that quote um, rather gets to the nub of it, that... If, if I go back to my point, which I made to Mr Chisholm, about um, an unplanned admission, a, a admission to geriatric care ward costing £47,000 and provision of care in one's home costing £6,000, clearly we can provide a lot more care for people in their home by saving one geriatric bed. And... Now, I, I think that's just completely and utterly straightforward and sensible, because apart from anything else, apart from just you know, my kind of, you know, my desire as finance minister to make sure the money goes as far as we possibly can make it go, um, spending the money on care in somebody's house will give them a better quality of life than being in a hospital ward. So there has to be a, a, a debate a, that's, you know, and a discussion that's taken forward that articulates that point of view. Um, I, like Mr McMahon, I, I, you know, I, I see debates taking part. I've seen debates taking place in, in my own community about, um, for example, uh, a change to um, dementia assessment uh, where in the past an individual would be taken from their home into a, a, a local hospital and assessed in a hospital situation for about a fortnight, if my memory says me right, to decide what type of care they would require. Now, the very act of taking somebody out of their home into a hospital, if they're in, you know, potentially somebody with dementia, is going to be a confusing thing in the first place. It's, you know, so therefore, that service has all been changed, but of course, it's been a, it's been a difficult process of managing that change, which the health board has got to, in partnership with the local authority, but it's been difficult. And I think, certainly, I feel, uh, Mr McMahon, in quoting the uh, Association of Directors of Social Work, used the term political leadership. I, I, I don't think there's any lack of political leadership here at all. I don't think the government could be any clearer about its view of how we should proceed. I think there's a... Um, that there is a difficulty sometimes politically when these issues get um, into uh, their consideration, but we have to exercise a clear leadership in that respect and, and, and uh, try to work with public bodies to, to, to bring it about. We probably break the consensus by giving examples of where that political leadership hasn't uh, existed and, and while everyone has signed up to the general principles, when tough decisions locally had to be made, um, politicians ignore the evidence and go with the, the, the headline-grabbing campaign rather than actually uh, defending and, and showing the political leadership that would allow the, the, the decision to be made which met with the, the agreed uh, consensus. Um, 
So I, I, I'll resist the temptation to that do temptation. that. But I, I, it comes down to the evidence, I think. And Lord Sutherland, uh, on, you know, talking about the same issue, asked the question, where is the survey? Where is the check on where uh, this is happening? Uh, so that we can ask why. And you know, if we're going to have an avoidance of the, the sort of difficulties in terms of politics, do we need more evidence so that when we are making these decisions about moving from acute services to primary care services, from moving uh, from uh, you know, the, the emergency spend to the preventative spend, that the empirical evidence is there um, that would allow people to have the confidence that when these decisions are being made by our health boards and, and others, that they're the right decisions for the longer term? I don't think there's any um, lack of evidence. I think there's, we've got evidence uh, all around us on, 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 these, on these questions. I think in, in preparing for, to come to the committee today, I was looking at, um, as, as I, I'm doing on a regular basis, to monitor the effectiveness of the, particularly the preventative spend agenda, and also the, um, the wider agenda on public service reform. A whole range of different approaches have been taken right across the country in trying to fulfil this agenda. And um, it is evidence-based. It is um, a, a whole approach that is designed to um, deliver improvements in the provision of services to individuals and to uh, deliver fiscal sustainability into the bargain. Um, and what we're increasingly doing is using that evidence base, that uh, practice of what's been achieved to inform and encourage the debate that's taking place uh, and the planning that's undertaken in all parts of the country. So where we, we have good examples, we are encouraging broader knowledge about that. The work that local authority chief executives are doing on benchmarking of public services is designed to inform that process into the bargain to essentially, not in some crude kind of leak tables way, but just comparative evidence. And we should never be frightened of comparative evidence. If we're frightened of comparative evidence, then I think we have got a problem uh, as to why things can be done more efficiently and more effectively delivering better outcomes in one part of the country versus another. We should be open to that evidence and to taking that forward. Um, so I think that, that that's the type of climate that the government is encouraging in that process. Dean. Thank you uh, very much, convener. Just three short points, really, um, to ask you. One is the, you're, we did make reference to the Highland Council before, and I had some experience of trying to merge uh, services and have cooperation between the Highland Health Board, the NHS, and the council departments, and that certainly wasn't, it wasn't easy. Um, I think people were quite uncomfortable, they weren't sure there was uncertainty and so on. But I wonder that there have been uh, some notable successes and people who have come uh, a long way to see the positives in that. How is that spreading across the country, given the government's desire to see at the end to, to silos and more progressive working together in, in local authority and uh, NHS? And secondly, um, the evidence that we had from the Beald Hanover Housing Trust, they had a quote again, and I think everybody's referred to this uh, extraordinary kind of comparison or the cost of emergency admissions, and they compare it by saying that, that we currently spend around four times more on emergency um, uh, um, admissions to hospitals uh, for the over 70s than on the entire free personal nursing care budget. Now, I don't know whether whether that's right, but we've, we've, we have them in quotes in our evidence. And I, I wonder about the, the comparison. Gavin was asking how, how we keep an eye on these figures or uh, the, if the increase in emergency admissions, but is that in any way related to the change in NHS 24? And, the, and again, just with information across highlands and islands, that might be difficult information to have, but the number of ambulance call-outs or the number of times that people are taken uh, with an emergency tag, as opposed to in the, in the past where they might have been dealt with locally, simply because there was either a doctor there or there wasn't a doctor there. But 
I know that um, the, the, the cost of the ambulance service, I mean, that, these, these figures would also be indicative in terms of knowing uh, if, that's, if that's on the increase or not and what the cause of that would be. And finally, on a more positive note, is just the, um, going back to John Mason's point in terms of some of the good news that we have and the fact that heart disease is on the decrease, a very positive article by Ian McWhorter recently that we tend to think constantly um, on, the, on the kind of negatives and the, and the worst side of our health. But in fact, there are good news stories and how do we uh, reflect that? And that's possibly not a question for you, I realise it's another minister. But given that, that so much of what we're looking at in terms of demographic and how we want to reflect maybe on people getting older and as somebody who's just recently become 40 um, I can be quite excited about that future. Thank you. Um, first of all on the, the, the issue about uh, the experience in, in Highland I, I, I would pay a very public and warm tribute to Highland Council and Highland Health Board because I think notwithstanding all of how difficult all of this stuff of integrating budgets and working together can be. Uh, I think these two bodies have uh, demonstrated tremendous commitment in making um, a challenging and demanding model work. And it's come about because of, in my assessment, absolutely crystal clear leadership from Highland Council and Highland Health Board. And I, you know, and I think um, it's a, it's um, a it's been a process which um, I think has taken some time to bring about, but it's been, uh, uh, I think a great deal has been achieved, and I think the foundations that are now in place will start to really deliver for people in the Highlands. And I think there's a particular reckoning. Now, the Highland model, uh, having said all that, uh, you know, may well or may not be appropriate for all parts of the country, but the principle is that there is integration and collaboration being undertaken by the two bodies. And I, and I think it's a, a really strong um, uh, foundation that has been established and uh, tremendous pride should be taken in it. Secondly, on um, the unplanned admissions issue and the relationship with NHS 24, um, I, I don't have detail in front of me that that, that enables me to, to, to give a specific answer to that point. But what I think is an issue, and this is again at the heart of the integration of health and social care, is that there's a certain amount of admissions to hospital that are undertaken because there is no other credible option available invariably at five to five on a Friday night or late into the evening. And that is where the integration of health and social care really matters that it might be that an individual does not need to go to um, an acute hospital to be admitted into A&E where, you know, and, and where the costs are very significant the minute an individual steps foot in the A&E hospitals. And of course, um, Mr Neil was making the point in Parliament in response to Mr Hume's question yesterday that, uh, or one of the questions that was uh, asked under Mr Hume's question yesterday, that if we had fewer people presenting at A&E because of alcohol abuse, would be a great deal better off as a country. Um, and I think that's a, a point extremely well made um, by, by the Health Secretary. Um, so one of the purposes of health and social care integration is to provide more credible alternatives for the care and support of individuals that may have just tipped into vulnerability at, um, at different stages. And uh, that will be, I, I think, one of the benefits that arises out of that. Finally, on the point about good news, um, I, I made the point um, in the debate, the Finance Committee's debate, just the last debate before the Christmas recess, that um, a great deal of attention was given uh, just a couple of, a few weeks before Christmas to the Audit Scotland report about the fact that, you know, no impact, broadly, the media coverage was, no impact has been made on reducing health inequalities in our society, despite the fact that in the last 10 years, the number of deaths through heart and stroke disease has reduced by 43%. That's an astonishing achievement. Again, in the debate before Christmas, I paid tribute to the fact that our predecessors had started off 
making a priority of tackling this issue. We had continued it, and results had been delivered. So I do think, uh, I'm not normally associated with being the Minister for Good News, but I do think there is a time and a place for us to actually recognise that we are making progress on some of these difficult issues. That appears to have exhausted questions from the committee. Um, and I just have one further uh, uh, question. Um, in, in your last response, you said, um, well, you, you said you were heartened by the crystal clear leadership being presented uh, in the Highlands. And I uh, am also encouraged by uh, the work that's being undertaken in uh, the City of Edinburgh Council uh, in terms of their long term financial plan. Uh, which uh, they, they have made projections, for example, over the next 25 years that there will be 43 per cent more households in Edinburgh. They are looking to redesign services as a result. And while some of the demographic projections that Edinburgh is looking at may not be exactly accurate, they are uh, taking steps to ensure that uh, they are prepared for those changes. What, therefore, would you say to local authorities such as uh, Western Bartonshire, who basically have said that, uh, and I quote, they do not use demographic projections beyond the three-year budgeting cycle uh, because um, they do not have funding plans over a longer period of time than three years. Uh, you, you talked about earlier on about perhaps that's an excuse. Do you think that's really a cop-out uh, in, in, in terms of them failing to actually take a, a longer-term view when other councils such as Edinburgh and indeed Highlands and Islands are doing so? I think there's a... Um there's a lot of drama that can be associated with um, a spending review. Um, and people thinking, oh, we can't do anything until we know the outcome of the spending review. And I'm sure um, Mr Chisholm is smiling wryly. I suspect he's heard some of these things, or maybe he's said some of these things. Who knows which side of the argument he was ever on. But we, if you, if you look at the pattern of public expenditure, there is a reasonable set of assumptions can be made about the level of continuity of funding that most public bodies could be experiencing. Now, you know, there are some exceptions to that. Of course there are. That's where change comes, and that's difficult. And as Mr McMahon has said, it's controversial, and I, I understand and appreciate that entirely. But I do think there is, uh, there is adequate information available to enable people to make reasonable um, medium-term decisions about the de delivery and the deployment of public services. That's what's informed the government's response to the Christie Commission, and, um, uh, and which has affected the, essentially the design of our public service reform agenda. Thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for your responses uh, this morning. We will, of course, be seeing more of you uh, later uh, this morning. Uh, that was the committee's uh, final oral evidence session as part of this inquiry. The committee will consider a draft report before the February recess, and we will also debate that report in March in the chamber. I am going to suspend briefly until 10.50 in order to allow a change of witnesses and a natural break for committee members.
are actually all ready. So uh, we turn now to the second of our two sessions with the Cabinet Secretary and our consideration of the Public Service Pensions Bill Legislative Consent Motion. Accompanying the Cabinet Secretary are Stuart uh, Fubister, I hope I've said that correctly, from the Scottish Government, and Chad Daughtry from the Scottish Public Pensions Agency. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make op an opening statement explaining the legislative consent motion. Cabinet uh, Secretary. Uh, thank you, Convener. I welcome the opportunity to discuss with the Committee this legislative consent memorandum, which concerns certain components of the UK Government's draft public service pensions bill. As the Committee will be aware, I made a statement to Parliament on public service pension reform on the 28th of November. Uh, during that statement, I set out the Scottish Government's position on the UK Government's approach to these wide-ranging reforms. I also ensured that Parliament was aware of the Chief Secretary of the Treasury's request that the, legislative consent, that the Scottish Government should support a legislative consent motion for certain provisions in the draft bill which encro encroached on devolved matters. Our consideration of that request and decision not to give that support and the opportunity to consider this matter by discussing the Legislative Consent Memorandum before you. I would make a number of points in connection with the Legislative Consent Memorandum. The UK Government asked that the Scottish Government should support a Legislative Consent motion which would effectively allow Westminster to take decisions on devolved pension schemes for six NDPBs and a small number of holders of uh, devolved judicial roles. The Scottish Government believes that it is this Parliament um, and not the Westminster Parliament that should decide on the terms of pensions for public service workers in Scotland. Consequently, I was not willing to bring forward the legislative consent motion pr proposed by the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Um, there has been some debate about the scope of potential legislative consent. The Scottish Government does not believe that the UK Government is required to seek the support of the Scottish Parliament for primary legislation to make changes to other public service pensions in Scotland beyond those covered in the memorandum. All of the main pension schemes, those for local government, NHS workers, teachers, police officers, firefighters and civil servants, are either only executively devolved to Scottish ministers or entirely reserved. That means that Westminster continues to set the main terms for those schemes. In his request to support an LCM, the Chief Secretary gave an undertaking that these provisions would be removed from the bill if the Scottish Government did not support the LCM. I wrote to the Chief Secretary on the 28th of November 2012, indicating that I would not agree to his request. Uh, I am pleased to confirm that the UK Government has already begun the process of making the necessary amendments to the Bill to remove these provisions. Um, the Scottish Government remains opposed to the way the UK Government has conducted these pension reforms in general. Its directive approach on employee contribution increases has left us no alternative other than to introduce them in Scotland. And the piecemeal approach to policy development has lacked transparency and resulted in a continued lack of certainty over UK Government policy intentions. Um, as far as the, these devolved pension arrangements are concerned, I have already indicated to Parliament that the Government will continue to take an inclusive, evidence-based approach to any further reform. That means using independent advice to assess the financial health of these schemes and the benefits they provide. If change is necessary, then it will take place in conjunction with the organisations themselves and with the support of legislation if required. Um, the Scottish Government has uh, set out its views in the Legislative Consent Memorandum, and I am happy to discuss that with the Committee. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I do not have any questions uh, for you. Questions I was going to ask you have actually answered in your opening statement. So I would therefore like to open it out to uh, colleagues around the table to see if any of them have any questions. Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks. Well, I think just uh, one thing I wanted to ask. In, in the financial implications, it talks about uh, any financial impact would be limited because of the small number of uh, people involved. I mean, could you give us any indication, even an estimate, of what kind of figures we're talking about? Well, there's the, the total number of schemes um, involve 1,750 people, which is 0.3% of the total membership of Scottish schemes. So it's, I think the financial implications are of a minimal level. So we're talking, what, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pounds? or? Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to give a figure at this stage. I think the, the, the numbers are, are very small, and as I indicate, we, we, have a, um, we will undertake an assessment of the financial health of the relevant schemes and obviously formulate a view as to whether any reform is required in due course uh, to determine uh, the, uh, any actions that are required to ensure the fiscal sustainability of the schemes. Jamie? Just a quick question about the, the process as to how we've arrived here. The, 
uh, the note uh, from the Scottish Government sets out that there was minimal formal engagement by the UK Government prior to the introduction of the, the Bill. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you could quantify that a little, Cabinet Secretary, and how it compares to uh, the normal experience of consultation where the UK Government is seeking uh, this Parliament's legislative consent. Well, the UK Government uh, advised me on the 4th of September 2012 that a legislative consent memorandum would be required in relation to this bill, which was seven working days prior to the introduction of the UK bill in the House of Commons on the 13th of September 2012. Uh, so that's completely and utterly at odds with the normal course of events. Normally there would be significant amount, you know, Mr Hepburn will appreciate a bill of this comple of the complexity of the Public Service Reform Bill requires tremendous preparation and scrutiny and dialogue on a whole host of different questions. So you know, we would normally be very much involved in that process uh, very early on, but uh, that was the circumstances in this case. I agree with your decision not to have a motion on this, but uh, more generally, I mean, is, is there a clear dividing line between what is executively devolved and what is, you know, in primary legislation? Because, I mean, many of us did receive, um, and I've, I've had a response from you, but many of us did receive emails, a lot of emails, in fact, suggesting that there was perhaps some doubt about what that dividing line was. Yeah, I think there's a... Um, if. If I can give the committee some uh, clarity on this point, um, essentially um, Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act at Section F3 um, it defines the reservation of um, pension schemes um, and uh, as I set out in my earlier remarks that relates to local government, NHS, teachers, police and fire. And uh, so ultimately there is the United Kingdom government has the ability to legislate at primary legislative level to change any of those uh, schemes. And in fact, if we take, for example, the local government pension scheme, and this has been an issue which I've met with various trade unions about uh, to explain the position. Um, at the present moment, the local government pension scheme is perfectly financially sustainable. Um, it's a, a final salary scheme, um, but the United Kingdom government legislation is going to say that final salary schemes must end. And so, essentially, primary legislation can be used to specify the character of individual schemes. What it can also be um, used to do is to set out any particular constraints. So, for example, um, the requirement to ensure that all schemes have um, the, the normal pension age and the state pension age are one and the same things. That uh, can be specified in primary legislation. Um, there are various um, elements of the schemes which are executively devolved, but for example, this legislation is going to require um, Treasury consent for any what are called cost sensitive issues. So, I, I, you know, that says to me there's going to be. Um, a great deal of um, greater scrutiny by the Treasury of the components of, of pension schemes than have been the case in the past. So is, is that why the level of contributions, I mean, is that, would the Treasury be invoking that if, you know, if it penalised um, you if you if you're allowed, say, um, smaller contributions? It, 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 these are slightly different factors. The, the increase in contribution rates in the short term are not about pension schemes. They are, are simply about contributions to the public purse. Uh, they don't make the pension schemes any stronger. They, they simply make a contribution to, to deficit reductions. They also create the platform for deciding the size of the cost envelopes that are um, available to support pension schemes, which ultimately determines the future scale and scope of individual pension schemes, and then determines um, what degree of flexibility we can undertake in the process. So, so you're saying the issue of contributions is, is not covered by the legislation at all, but so that it would just be the Treasury invoking that in terms of public expenditure Correct, control? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. There are no uh, further questions. Um, can I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary? Um,
um, for his evidence this morning in both the demographic inquiry and the legislative consent motion. I'd just like to allow the Cabinet Secretary and officials to leave before we discuss this matter uh, further. <coughs> Colleagues, the committee will now consider the evidence given by the Cabinet Secretary on the Legislative Consent Motion. Uh, the committee has to report to Parliament uh, on the LCM. Are there any particular issues which members wish to raise in the report? Or are they content for it to simply uh, refer to the official report of this evidence session? Okay. Are members uh, content with the terms of the Legislative Consent Memorandum to report accordingly? Um, members have indicated that they are. Uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, we are now going to move into a private session. Uh, at the beginning of the meeting, the committee agreed to do so. Uh, so we'll now uh, allow uh, the public and official report to leave. Um, and we'll move on to item five um, as soon as they've done so.